Thanks, you guys. Yeah, San Francisco Dharma Collective is really special. I've been thinking about that lately, especially its focus on the Mahayana teachings. You know, in the Bay, you have a lot of um, Theravada, which is fabulous. Against the Stream used to be more kind of early stream-based Theravada teachings, which is beautiful. Um, but I really appreciate the San Francisco Dharma Collective's openness, really, to all the different traditions. But remember when they were telling me in the early days when they decided to keep the rent and try to create a peer-led sangha, that they really were open to more um, different voices, uh, especially within the Mahayana, Vajrayana traditions. And that's one thing that is very strong within the Tibetan tradition is those the, the kind of middle and later streams of Buddhist <coughs> poetry and way of seeing the world and jumping into practice in sometimes very unconventional different ways, whether it's through Zen or Indian Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism or Korean. Or I see that there's a class right before ours uh, that, that are inspired from Rob Berbera's uh, teachings. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name right, but uh, he, a wonderful teacher who just passed away earlier this year. So, and then all the other really cool things that San Francisco Dharma Collective is doing. So we really need to keep keep this alive and keep spreading the word. Tell your friends about it, and uh, you know, give your time and energy and uh, your support in any way that you can to help showing the love so that the wonderful board and volunteers uh, keep are you know are inspired to keep showing up as well. So welcome everybody. This is almost our New Year's Eve, and uh, I don't know about you, but I'm ready to say bye bye, <laughs> bye bye 2020. <laughs> and so, who knows what 2021 will bring? Maybe I'm naive in thinking it'll be better, but I would I, I'd like to choose hope, and uh, hopefully, we will. Um, start to move in different ways together and be able to interact and, and be with each other. That's what I'm looking forward to. Um, so I thought tonight we'll, we'll do the next slogan. We'll meditate now in a moment. Then we'll talk about the 25th slogan. And then we'll, we'll end like we did last week with some chanting. But this time we'll do Tatara, uh, the female Buddha of compassion. Uh, Aryatara is really like the, you could say she's like the mother of Tibet, you know, I mean, the Tibetans really um, absorbed the, her teachings and practices, and she's kind of like uh, Mother Mary for Tibetans, you know, and so we'll we'll chant to her for a while with a beautiful melody that I learned a long time ago, and so we'll go out singing again tonight. I want to have spread some joy and join together with some joyful noise or some kind of noise, whatever it is. <laughs> Hopefully there'll be some joy mixed in along with other things. And so I just also want to share, if you do like chanting and like kind of the juicy creative expression of devotional practice, I've got two really cool things coming out this weekend. And um, also to let you know, I do a f Friday morning weekly drop-in class totally like this easy drop-in no commitment <laughs> donna based 10 a.m to 11 15 a.m the 21 taras guided practice it's really focused on practice so that's on my website that i just posted to the chat but then saturday i'm helping uh menla which is a tibetan buddhist retreat center on the East Coast uh, under the auspices of Tibet House U.S., which is a cultural preservation nonprofit org uh, founded by the Dalai Lama. And so they have ongoing events that started yesterday, but Nina Rao and I, my dear friend, who we chant and tell stories and do uh, different courses every month, we're joining together. We're going to do some chants to the goddess. And I will be leading chants to Tara and some others, <clears throat> and Nina will as well. And that is on um, Saturday afternoon, 
and you can find that on the web page I just posted. And then on Sunday afternoon, we have our Wisdom Rising, which is kind of more fun like that. So I feel like doing some heart opening. You know, I don't know about you, but these times during the winter, we can get a little sad, a little depressed, a little down and out. And I have really found that, that singing uplifts the spirits, music, kind of moving in new ways. And maybe I'm preaching to the choir. Maybe you guys are already singers, maybe even more so than I am. But I find that it's a really wonderful way to get through the, the darker days and nights and kind of, you know, we're still in this tunnel. So bring some light into the tunnel. Okay, so that's all for my announcements. Why don't we settle in and do some practice? Take a moment to shift to really make sure you're comfy. <clears throat> Finding a position, whether it's upright or supine, where you can have a spine nice and kind of straight, but not rigid. Sit for about a half an hour. And then allow the eyes to close and start to take some deep breaths. <coughs> and softening any tension or tightness with the out breath. Notice if there's tension in the jaw or the face, release it and soften the muscles of the face. <clears throat> Bring the chin a little bit more in towards the center of the throat, lengthening the back of the neck. And then the shoulders releasing away from the ears. Hands resting in your lap or on your thighs. <coughs> and feel the spine nice and buoyant, and lifted, yet relaxed. The mus musculature around the spine, the ribs soft. And the belly soft and receptive to the breath. <clears throat> Offer the breath down into the bowl of the pelvis. <clears throat> Excuse me. A frog crawled in my throat right when I started to guide the meditation. <coughs> And really offer that breath down into the kidney region too, like a recharging your battery packs of your adrenals and the kidneys, right at the bottom, lower ribs, back body, front body as well, nourished by the breath. Relaxing the hips and the muscles of the legs all the way down to the feet. If you're in a chair, you can have your feet nice and <clears throat> flat on the floor. And the pelvis is slightly, just ever so slightly tilted forward. Notice if you're gripping in the sacrum or the low back. Soften that with the out breath. And now take a moment to make a personal prayer of refuge and bodhicitta. So refuge is acknowledging that we need to go to refuge for a while, for, from time to time. Take refuge in our practice, 
<clears throat> in our teachers, in our sangha, in the dharma. A place to rest from the heat of the sun and replenish ourselves. And bodhicitta is the heartfelt aspiration to practice for the benefit of yourself and others. It's opening the heart of compassion, recognizing the interconnectedness of all of us who live on this beautiful planet. Spend some time with the mindfulness of the breath. Just feeling that silky breath as it flows in and out of the body. <clears throat> Nourishing the tissues, oxygenating the blood. Feel the flow, hear the sound of the breath as it flows in and out. And allow yourself to settle Settling the body in its natural state, aligned with gravity, at ease within itself. Settling the speech in its natural state by resting in quietude, free of dis discursive talk. But also letting the breath be natural, unforced. And then settling the mind in its natural state, releasing the grasping, the clinging onto thought. Soon as you notice the thought formations arising within the space of the mind, with the out breath, soften and release, release, release. And when you release, there's a sense of broadening that opens into a vast, more open space of the mind. See if you can maintain that quality of space. And notice if there's any remnant of kind of a contrivance or a, an egoic feeling or even a subtle egoic underlying feeling of I am meditating. Even release that thought, that posture, that stance. Meditation is about finding that natural state, free of adornment, free of effort, your natural state. Feel that.
release again and again. You could even say internally to yourself, release and open, release and open. And rest, free of grasping, free of distraction. Rest in that limpid, open, clear, wakeful, natural state. And gently bring that wandering mind back to this moment, this simple presence of the breath in the body. And resting in that broad, open awareness that pervades all of your perception. And stabilize that. Learn to stay and release and remain.
Letting all those thoughts, all those things we tell ourselves, to release back into the space from which they came. We don't need to ruminate in the same old way. Let's create new habits. It's good to feel bored with yourself. The same old things again and again. Just letting that go and open to the quality of space between the thoughts. And rest in that. Mm, you may feel some joy, some peace, some pleasant states arise within that space. It's like cleaning the house that you can rest and feel good in your environment. Allow the space so that something else can arise. Something less habitual and more natural. A natural state. Rest. And now we'll round out the practice with some compassion, practice of Tonglen. Feel that the manifestation, the embodiment of your enlightened heart, your true deep, deep wisdom nature, manifests as an orb of radiant light at your heart center the so-called seed of the soul, the deeper, deep, most innermost cave of the heart, that dimension beyond space and time within you, your own ultimate bodhicitta, you could say, your Buddha nature is abiding in that heart center as an orb of radiant light. And this light 
And your own rigpa, your own pristine awareness is beyond birth, death, time, and space. It is this Vajra-like adamantine indestructible nature of your own mind. And take some time here to breathe in and release into that knowing, that luminous source of wisdom and love within you. first practicing Donglen with oneself as we learn in these slogans. Take some time to touch in to <clears throat> anything that you would like to invite home. Something that you've pushed away or haven't wanted to look at or have within your body, mind, matrix, but it's there following you like your shadow. Why don't you turn towards that shadow and with the in-breath feel that you're drawing it into this luminous light, your heart center, where any of the pain or delusion or confusion is transformed and evaporated by that luminous light. And then the out breath is an offering of soothing space, acceptance, integration, whatever feels right to you. Where you're drawing in, welcoming home, where it can then transform into medicine, nectar, with the out breath. This is alchemy. You're breathing in the base metal of your any afflictive emotions, hopes and fears, physical pain, illness, transforming it at the orb of light at your heart, and then offering the medicine with the out breath. Working with yourself here for about 10 more breath cycles.
releasing that. And then open to another, a person, maybe a friend, a family member, a loved one, or a neutral person, or a so-called challenging person, someone there may be a charge with. So just choose now. Let your mind roam and land on someone who you sense there's a, an import need of prayer, of attention, of nourishment. And we can implement this visualization of inhaling a, like a smoky vapor, drawing their suffering, confusion, delusion in, where you transform it at your heart, that indestructible orb of light, your Buddha nature. And then breathe out a remedy, a wish that they be free of suffering. So you're breathing in the confusion, ignorance, illness, whatever it is, you're transforming it and breathing out a remedy, a prayer, of healing, free of attachment to the outcome, staying with the breath. We'll do about 10 more breath cycles in silence. And then releasing that back into the space of the mind and let's spend some time breathing with the world, just wishing that the world be free of all the strife, the conflict, the pollution, just breathing it in. If it feels too much to breathe it into your heart if you're not feeling at ease with that, then just breathe it out of, like you can imagine you're up on the moon, looking down at the earth, and breathing all the negativity off of the planet, and it evaporates into the vast expanse of the universe, and then with the out breath, you're offering a cool, clear breeze of healing, of light, of balance, peace, and the quality of 
a resolution, those who are hungry getting food, those in war-torn areas receiving shelter and peace, those ill with coronavirus recovering. Let your imagination roam here and really spend time with the in-breath and the out-breath. And then releasing any visualization, any effort, and just rest in your natural state again. Just rest. The mind at ease and open. The heart tender. Yet the mind is open and able to hold and witness everything that arises. The compassionate gaze. And we'll close with a little dedication of merit for the benefit of all beings. May any positive energy or momentum that came from our practice be dedicated to the vast ocean of positive energy that we know is all around us. For the benefit of all. Thank you. So we'll come back together now. I might have put you to sleep. I noticed my voice was very, <laughs> it's kind of an internal night. But hey, maybe you needed to rest and be put to sleep a little bit. So here we are together. Be nice to see you. If you can turn your camera on even for a little bit to say hi, give a little, a little feeling of connection and sangha. I know not everybody can, and that's okay, but it's nice to see you. Yeah, hi, everybody. I wish we could go around the circle, hear how you guys are all doing. <laughs> uh, any questions, comments? Uh, maybe a few people can check in and say hello, and how are you doing? How was, how was that meditation for you? How was... How are you, Lo Jonging? How are you doing your mind training? How was your week of mind train training practice? You can 
unmute yourself, I hope. I don't know if the settings, Pamela is the setting. Yeah, thumbs up. Somebody wants to unmute and say hello or just chat in something is fine too. How was your, the last week's slogan was change your attitude but remain natural. Remember that? Feels like so long ago. How did that feel for you? Did you, did you get to practice that this week? Change your attitude but remain natural. Hi, who's this? Hi. Allie? This Allie Sue. Hi, Allie Sue. Hi. Um, I want to sh just share that last week was really, it was a great practice of Tonglen that we did. My husband came with me, um, Lisa's friend, Federico, came with me and um, we practiced together and there's few things that we can do as a couple because we're so different, but he meditates with um, SF Dharma and um, it was really beautiful. And then, you know, I wanted the next day we got a call. Our, our really good friend's father's been suffering with cancer and he was released to hospice. Mm -hmm. And so my partner turned to me and he said, let's, let's ask if we can go into the backyard, social distance and do some tonglen for him. And we mm -hmm. did. And it was really, it was really powerful. It felt such a beautiful application of this teaching that you that you shared and um, it was just so sweet to be able to practice with him and I felt our like hearts really connect so that was beautiful and um, I really cherish him because he reminds me of the application a lot of times I forget about I'm not as good as the application part as he is so Thank you. Oh, thank you for sharing, Ali Sue. That's so great. Isn't it wonderful to have that beautiful heart depth to share with your partner? That's great. And how wonderful that you could practice for, for your friend in hospice. And you can practice from anywhere, too. Practice from home. You know, for yeah, them. He did, he did pass. He passed today. He passed today. He passed It was wonderful because we got to spend time with him. We're one of the few people that got, they have those French doors that open. So we were able to stay six feet apart and his bed just was a little bit of lawn. So it, it, when we went to do the tongue line, we, we were able to like see him and say goodbye to him and mm. see his face. And, and mm. just in these times, it's, it's so, so, it was so moving and so special. And he was very touched. Wonderful. That is application right there. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Who else would like to share and come out from your from your quietude here? Give us the gift of your presence. Hi, Chandra. Hi, who's talking? Oh, it's Donna. Donna. Hi. Hi. Um, well, kind of with the, you know, we're just about to change into the ne next year. Um, I, today I was thinking a lot about dukkha. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, my relationship to dukkha. <laughs> um, you know, how I want things next year to be different. <laughs> mm. But but um but I have no control over what that will be. Um and uh I don't know. Um, that's that's. I was listening to a lot of talks about it. Uh, at least one talk today mm -hmm. um, on Dharma Seed, and you know, having a wise relationship with dukkha. 
kind of whatever that means. <laughs> so, um, um, and while I'm looking forward to a new year, I'm also, I also don't want things to change to be back the way that they were. Yeah. Um, before COVID, um, in a way, this year has been about um, really opening our eyes to what is in front of us. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. That's that's really all I have to say. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing to observe how we oscillate between hope and fear, you could say, around dukkha and sukha. It's such a great word. I mean, dukkha really does capture the... Dukkha means suffering. And sukha means ease or well-being or, you know, bliss even. And maybe I've shared this before. Donna, maybe that your Dharma talk that you heard today talked about this, but the from a Sanskrit scholar friend of mine, I learned that this, the, the dukkha and sukha have very interesting origins in ancient India. There are terms that were used to describe the um, quality of the wagon wheels you know, on a chariot or a wagon that you'd ride on. And so if a wheel was made just right, with the spokes coming right to the central axis in just the right way, then the ride on the wagon or the chariot was smooth, and that was sukha. <laughs> if that axis was off-center just a bit and the ride was bumpy, that's dukkha. And we've had a dukkha ride, haven't we? I mean, really, like, so I'm sorry, you could say just as a big, long dukkha ride. <laughs> um, I mean, that's kind of pessimistic, but of course, that's not 100% true. But, you know, the Buddha's first truth was life is suffering. But what, what really what that means is that conditioned existence is impermanent because conditioned existence is always changing, birth, death, changing, uh, what you like goes away, what you don't like comes to you, all of these kind of ever-changing factors of an impermanent world naturally gives rise to a quality of dissatisfaction and dukkha in our life for a bumpy ride. And that's why meditation helps us find that sukha kind of beyond or within the depths of our being that isn't uh, dependent upon external circumstances always pleasing us. Not easy. Oh, yeah. But it is good to watch the, the hope and fear and the wanting and the not wanting. And You know, I one of my Tibetan teachers was so serene, and I even, back in 99 and 2000, helped guide some trips to Tibet with, with him and his students, and he was always so calm, even even in the midst of like being detained by the Chinese police, you know, where we they were saying we were in an area that we shouldn't be in in Tibet and it was scary. He was always so calm. We used to call him the Teflon Lama. <laughs> just things would just slide off of him like Teflon. And he'd always be like, No problem. In Tibetan the word is Ke Nangimari. Okay, Nangimari, no problem. We'll be, we'll get through this. It's okay. Okay, Nangimari. Or he'd often say, we'd say, oh, how is the food? Or oh, how are you, Rinpoche, today? Or you know, to everybody's wanting the teacher to be happy, and he'd say, not good, not bad. <laughs> not good, not bad. You know, just surfing that that line, right in between the wanting this or mm, not wanting that, you know, the the pendulum swings of drama. And it was, I found that day after day, being in the presence of someone like that, especially when we're traveling and we've got a lot of people, lots of drama, <laughs> you know, people aren't comfortable in their hotel or the bus breaks down, you know, I think 
everybody knows what traveling is like. And um, in the midst of those kind of extreme scenarios, to be with somebody who just remained so calm, like at the center of the wheel, that was sukha. So like, how can we find that sukha as we're kind of threading the needle right into this new year? I find the daily practice, you know, I've been going outside and sky gazing. I, ha I have to be outside right now as much as possible. And this, we always have this time at the transition between the old year and the new coming in, in the Bay Area, where there's this nice kind of dry weather where the skies are so powder blue and the sunrises are this mix of powder pink and powder blue. And the sunsets are this deep orange with green blue. I mean, go outside and just rest your gaze on either the sunrise sky or the sunset sky. If you can, go on your roof, go on a hike. I don't know, go sit in the park. I don't know where everybody's living here, but uh, that's been one way of... of uh, and then as I'm so happy gazing at the sky, then I'm asking myself, Okay, could you be, could you feel like this in an airplane? <laughs> you know, could you feel like this in a prison cell? Could you feel like this on a bumpy bus ride, you know, in, in India? But, but we have to find those natural places and then we can help kind of spreading, spreading that feeling into the other more challenging places in our life. So maybe one more share and then we'll move into the uh, slogan. If there is one. Uh, I'll go. This is Hi, Eric, Eric. In, in Seattle. I'm dropping in for the first Wednesday in a long time. I yeah, I haven't seen you in a while. Yeah, I've been a little squirrely through the election and stuff, but I'm trying to come back down to ground. And uh, mm -hmm. Of course, it's rainy up here, and we can't see the sky all that often. So it's uh, right. well, it's it's the ceiling is there, but it's very it's like you can reach up and touch it. Yeah. Um, but it was clear a couple of nights last week, and I did go down the street and looked up and saw Saturn and Jupiter together, and Mars and the Moon are also traveling together when the Moon is near full right now. And yeah. So, the challenge sometimes is remembering what is up there when yeah. you cannot see it. And that, I guess, would be like being, I live in a tiny studio apartment and there's a lot of construction going on outside. So I, a lot of times I find that a bit, it's a bit claustrophobic in here. Yeah. But remembering what is out there, and remembering that this space it actually permeates this room and goes outwards is something that I, I, I find useful and it can be very comforting in a way yeah so yeah I, and there's also there's also a cedar tree in a park nearby that i like to stand with so um, there's something about the cedar trees up here that are just very very calm mm -hmm. don't quite put my finger on it except that i feel like i'm getting to know this tree in a way. good very that's sweet. your refuge your refuge tree mm -hmm. yes also, That's I mean, the imagery you, you just shared with me also made me think of how wonderful it is to lie down on the earth or on your deck or on a, you know, wherever and sky gaze that way, you know. And even if you can't see a clear sky, you know, letting that quality of space pervade your awareness as much as possible. And then maybe you'll get a glimmer of a star. Then you could stargaze. Like, let that be your shamatha anchor. <laughs> your stargazing meditation. Oh, was somebody else going to say something? Thanks for sharing, Eric. It's nice to have you back. Finding your sukha within the dukkha. That could be a slogan. I was thinking we should do like an open source uh, compilation of modern day slogans. Wouldn't that be fun? Just have some kind of Google form or something where people could type in their, their little fun slogans that come to you. 
I mean, these slogans are fabulous. Of course, they're deep. Uh, but, you know, they arose within the fabric of the culture of Tibet, you know, inspired by the wisdom teachings coming from India. But these, these slogans took root in the oral lineages and the practitioners who were out in nature or in their monasteries or nunneries and, or in their homes, finding their own wisdom. We could do that, too. It's a project. Have some kind of open source slogan ongoing poem okay so this one tonight is really fun it's kind of a little tongue-in-cheek you could say so now you know we're in this phase of like you know daily training like how do you ap apply it how do you apply your spiritual practice to your to your daily life and so the 25th slogan is don't talk about injured limbs <laughs> Don't talk about injured limbs. What does that mean? Essentially, it means don't focus on the negative. Yeah, <laughs> it's pretty good for us right now. And that means like pertaining to ourselves or others. We tend to do that. I know I do. Oh, this hurts. That hurts. Oh, you didn't clean that up. <laughs> you know. How about watering some? At least like more than you know, fifty-one percent positive seeds throughout the day, if not more, right? So, the commentary to this is is essentially as we, you know, as we begin to uncover the layers of our being through meditation and self-inquiry, spiritual practice, we definitely begin to see our own patterns, right? And not, it's not always so pretty. So our own afflictive emotions, or as a common word in Buddhism that's nyonmong in Tibetan, or klesha in Sanskrit, which is, are these kind of afflictive patterns that drag us down. You have like ignorance, delusion, you have anger or hatred, um, you've got pride, arrogance, then there's clinging, grasping, attachment, desire, and then you've got um, kind of like a jealousy, competitiveness, and comparing. and So those are the five kind of main kleshas. Of, or often you'll see like the, the three main ones are the, are the three poisons of ignorance, attachment, delusion. So it's so that those are really kind of like the things that we're starting to purify, to work through, to integrate, to heal as we start our spiritual practice. And so we start to see them more clearly. You know, where do we get stuck? They seem to come in technicolor. And we think that maybe spiritual practice is making us worse off, more dukkha, less sukha than before. But it's really just a, a revealing of what was beneath the surface. And stuff can come up. So as that happens, uh, hopefully they also diminish, right? So they come up, it's, it's like we're airing, we're airing ourselves out. We're healing and we're giving space for these things to come, to be revealed, and to diminish. And as this path unfolds, we can also then start to get very aware of other people's glaciers. <laughs> And maybe fixate on that a little bit too much. So hyper aware of others' shortcomings. Maybe we want to change them, share our learning with them, and tell them how great it would be if they also changed. <laughs> but we have to ask ourselves, are these faults that we observe really out there? Or might they be... Uh, filtered through our own perception, like projections. So we have to be very, especially as we start to uncover our own patterns, be really humble, kind of like the earlier slogan. Like just have some humility, some naturalness. Don't get too busy yet with trying to fix the world just because you're, you're feeling great about what you're fixing in yourself. So, of course, there's that old saying. I know it's probably old. Tire, tiresome by now, but if you're pointing one finger out, you've got three pointing towards you. It's that. 
you know, don't focus on the negative out there, but also in here. Have some space around it. And recognize that everything that we see, everything that we feel, everything that we hear is filtered through our own mind. We don't really have access to anything objective out there. So even though we think we're right, we have to be a little bit cautious. It's possible we're not 100% right, that we're not seeing things so clearly, that we may not be the great objective observer that we think we are. <laughs> Oh, yeah. So, you know, uh, in, in, as we uh, kind of move through the layers of our being and we do begin to be more aligned with reality in certain ways, less clouded by our kind of filters, it's said that the mind does become more perceptive in, in an aligned way. But of course, we need to be careful not to think that we're perfect. But there's this quality of pure perception that starts to come about. And this pure perception is very interesting because it is, um, the word in Tibetan is very interesting. It's dak nang. Dak means pure, nang means appearances, or perceptions, you could say. So that when we, through our practice, through our study, that when we begin to connect and engage from the vantage point of our Buddha nature, our compassionate heart, our awakened wisdom, mind, heart, when we begin to engage and connect with the world and ourselves from that vantage point, this is called pure perception. So it's like we're shifting our perception, our perspective from kind of delusion of cloudy unclear to the more clear alignment with the Tao you can say or the truth through connecting with our Buddha nature then we get to, we also see that in others so we don't fixate we don't focus on the broken limbs you know we don't focus on the negative so much we can see that like us when others make mistakes, it doesn't mean they're bad, evil people, but that they're Buddhas who have tempor temporarily forgotten <laughs> who they are and have faltered, have stumbled. So it's about having a choice about how we attend to things. And we also should recognize that, of course, People do have faults, but no one is inherently evil. Even our own mental afflictions, these kleshas, which are really at the root of our suffering. This is what the Buddha taught. That these afflictions, especially ignorance, is like that root affliction, this not knowing, this ignoring who we really are in our depths, and this forgetting, and then that gives rise to all sorts of other jealousies and competitiveness and anger and attachment and all of that. So even these mental afflictions or these afflictive emotions, these kleshas, which are the root of our suffering, they have no inherent existence either. They are empty of intrinsic, separate solidity. And when we gain more familiarity in our practice with letting go, releasing thought, releasing this grasping clinging to concepts and opinions and stances, we can have more agility with like, oh yeah, there's that afflictive emotion. I see you, Mara. I see you. Thank you. But I don't need to believe you and that's not all that I am. So we can do that with ourself more and do that with others. There's a, a beautiful saying by the great philosopher, psychologist, uh, uh, William James, what we attend to becomes our reality. So what do you attend to? Are we attending to those kind of broken limbs or injured limbs? Or are we kind of watering the positive seeds? You know, with kind of a sobriety, not totally naive. But it's a choice. 
And so on a relative level, we need skillful means to to navigate the waters of samsara, right? So skillful means is very important. It's upaya in Sanskrit or tap in Tibetan. It's different, you know, techniques, ways of working in the world, being in relationship. But on an absolute level, we can try to maintain that pure view. That we're all, what is it, we're all angels just wearing this kind of, flesh body for a period of time, you know, really purely seeing your partner, your family, your enemy, your boss, your students as Buddhas. Or in Tantra, we say Dakas and Dakinis. The Dakas and Dakinis are the enlightened aspects of masculine feminine. We need a word for (laughs) non-binary. But, so, both are true. It's that quality of being in the world, but not of it. Holding both the the conduct as fine as barley flour, as Padmasambhava said, that his conduct is as fine and refined, like compassion, ethics, as the finest ground barley flour, tsampa, Tibetan food, it's like their staple, tsampa. And then, yet, within that fineness of conduct and ethics, holding the view as vast as the sky, meaning having a vast perspective, understanding that we are all temporarily delusional Buddhas wandering around this planet. (laughs) It's a funny image. So, for example, like if someone makes a mistake, rather than shaming and blaming them, connect with that pure perception. Oh, they're an enlightened being who just stumbled. So help uplift them. Water the seeds of goodness in them. Encourage them. Reflect the positive back to them. Of course, this is what we do with children as much as we can, really reflecting back the positive again and again, and doing that with ourselves as well. And in terms of working with ourselves, even in applying this in meditation, this quality of mindfulness, of noticing thoughts, whether they're negative or positive or neutral, Noticing them arise and fall away without solidity. This empty nature of thoughts and feelings. They're here, they're fully human, and yet they're not all of who we are. And return and touch in to your basic goodness again and again. Remembering your basic goodness. You are good. It's your essence, no matter how much we've messed up. <laughs> and so that's that's my commentary to this 25th slogan. This Yenlak Nyambar Jumi Ja. Yenlak is limbs, Nyambar is injured or broken. Je mi ja means don't talk about it. Don't talk about injured limbs. Oh, that's interesting. I saw some of those kind of like little wisdom sayings pop up in my Instagram, which I'm trying not to look at very much these days, but it's hard not to. But one little nice wisdom was gossip dies when it hits the ear of a, of a wise being. <laughs> it just falls away. It can't be perpetuated. I thought that was interesting. I don't know who said it. Maybe it was some Hallmark card writer. But it was sweet. And it made me think of this slogan. Or this slogan made me think of this saying. It, 
maybe we don't need to talk so much. Sometimes it's nice to just say, okay, thank you. <laughs> so, and of course, there are times when things need to be said, when a mistake needs to be acknowledged and apologized for, absolutely. So, any questions or comments, observations about that? Uh, maybe we'll take one or two and then we'll do some mantra. Did somebody send a chat in? I saw somebody while I was talking with the chat went in. Well, it says, I've also read that slogan 25 refers to not making fun of others' infirmities, like the gimp or hunchback. In other words, not cultivating a sense of superiority over others or dwelling on our superior faculties. Sure, absolutely. Yes. Yes. And then Walt also shared a lion's roar uh, in what came in his inbox today from Lion's Roar. It's a Pema Chodron article from several months ago. I think he shared it with everyone, so you could click on that and open it in your browser if you're curious to read that after class. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Onwards and upwards with Tara. So I'll paste the mantra in the chat. Okay, so you can see it there. It's Om Tare Tu Tare Ture Swaha. How many people know this mantra already? Yeah, good fair amount. So I'll just uh, quickly kind of translate it and then then I'll begin to um, chant it and you can listen and join in when you want. So Om is this, it's really, it's pure vision actually, you know, it's that pure perception. Om is the absolute dimension, this vast expanse of reality. It's said that if the universe made a sound, which I think it does, it would be oh, it's that cosmic sound. And then Tare is the vocative form of her name, Tara. Tara literally means savioress or one who saves, one who actually traverses, like the ocean of samsara. And then it also means star. So Tara is like the savioress, this female Buddha of compassion. So O oh, Tara is what Tare means. O oh, Tara. Tut Tare is her name again. You see Tare is there at the end. The Tut at the beginning means come near, like close. So it's O oh, Tara, come near. Be with me, really. Be near me. And then ture means swiftly. And Tara is like the wind. She's swift like the wind. She said to come to beings who call for her with devotion, with an openness. So, oh, Tara, please come near me swiftly. Oh, Tara. And then swaha is a common ending for mantras. It means so be it or may it be so. Swaha. Okay. And so as we chant, really feel your heart as much as you can, opening to the opening with that devotion, asking for blessing, for protection. One of her superpowers is to free beings from fear and danger. So feel as you chant within you these subtle and more overt aspects of how fear might live in you, right? and ask her to wash that away with a shower of blessings. Yeah. All right. And it's it's energy, you know, she's she's there's green taras, there's white taras, red taras, yellow taras, 
blue taras, you, you name it. You've got the whole rainbow of taras. So even just feel her, or if you know what she looks like, you can imagine her in the sky in front of you, showering down rainbow light. You can get as ornate or as simple as you like. The most important thing is to feel, is to feel, feel the Great Mother with us here tonight as we transition into another day, another year. So really feel that now, take some breaths. Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha 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 Tare tu tare tu re swaha om tare tare tu re swaha om tare tu tare re swaha om tare tu tare Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha Tare tu tare re swaha om Tare tu tare tu 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 Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Re Swaha Om Tare Tu Tare Tu 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 Re
tu tare tu re swaha om tare tu tare tu re swaha om tare tu tare tu re swaha om tare tu tare tu re swaha just recite the mantra simple now. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha. Like a wheel turning. Feel the blessings of the mantra resonating through your body. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha. 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 Open your heart. Open your mind to the blessings of Tara. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha You can go slow or fast, however you like Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha 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 Om Dari Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha 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 It's said to recite like the buzzing of the bees, this kind of hypnotic vibration within you. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha 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 So whenever you're feeling the mind going into negativity or focusing on injured limbs, Replace those thoughts with a mantra. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha. And remember the feeling. Remember the meaning of the mantra. And that is another form of lojong, of mind training. Yeah? We're training our mind. Turning towards more joy, more integration. And we're, again, watering those seeds, as Thich Nhat Hanh likes to say. So, my friends, this brings us to the end of our Wednesday night well of being. I hope you found some uh, nourishment and some uh, solace in the well of your own being and our own being together. And again, um, they've posted the link for other events. Please drop in to as much as you can and want to. And uh, we will see you next week. May you have a wonderful new year and may you stay safe and healthy and we'll see you again, I'm sure. Thank you everyone for coming. Big love. Om Dari Tu Dari Tu Re Swaha. <laughs> Yay. All right. Lots of love. You can unmute and say goodbye if you want. Bye. Ciao. Bye. 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 Bye
Thanks, Mason, Pamela. Bye, Thank Jandra. You. Bye. Thank you. Yeah, bye. Thank you. Thank you, Mason, Pamela. Bye, Gina. Happy New Year. Bye.